is being translated also in Spanish. There are two different links for the English and Spanish versions. You can find them on the website. So if you're a Spanish speaker or joining from Latin America, feel free to hop on whichever link you prefer. We're super grateful that you all are joining us today, and we think there couldn't be a better time for this conversation. So as many of you might already know, the first draft of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework was released about a month ago. And the framework is going to be the world's pathway for halting and reversing the biodiversity crisis. Um, and it's in the final stages of being negotiated. And while we all acknowledge that priority should certainly be given to maintaining natural ecosystems, the current draft seems to ignore the vital role that agricultural landscapes can have in contributing to biodiversity conservation. So this is really the topic of this series and the topic of today um, is being able to really move to an understanding of the importance of agricultural and managed ecosystems um, and to better understand the role that they play. So what I'm gonna do is introduce our keynote speaker who will be able to really give you an overview of the topic. And with more than 20 years of experience in environmental law, he's a specialist in the negotiation, facilitation, and mediation of conflicts of public interest. He's been trained in the court justice of Costa Rica and holds a PhD in interdisciplinary ecology, a master's in Latin American studies, and a law degree. So please join me in welcoming the Vice Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica, Franklin Paniagua. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you, Selena. Thank you, uh, UCN, for organizing this forum and for assuming one of the uh, cutting edges topics of um, current conservation um, efforts and, and, and conservation administration in general, which is the relationship between agriculture and, um, and, and conservation and biodiversity conservation in, uh, in a specific. I would like to start by um, uh, just a, a brief overview of what Costa Rica has been, um, what his efforts have been in, um, in, in, recent, in, in recent promotion and development of, um, of conservation in, uh, in accordance to the, um, the, the conventions, the biodiversity convention uh, goals. And, and uh, here the country has stepped um, step up in um, in its goals and its ambition uh, into this uh, ambition to protect 30% of our land base and 30% of our marine scape, um, of our ocean scape um, in, uh, in this 30 by 30 goal. And this is currently our most um, upstanding um, effort is to achieve 30% 30, 30 of land, 30% of sea conservation. A 30% of land is something that we have been um, close to achieving uh, because we have under 26% of land that it's already protected or under some kind of protection. Some of those um, levels of protection are not fully um, Ex excluded zones for uh, for communities or for um, production, but some of them, but uh, around a a twenty percent is, um, and marine is is where that edge is. I, I want to bring up marine because it's the it's it's a place where we're currently now focused and we're making a, a strong leapfrog uh, jump to uh, go from almost 2% to that 30% uh, in one single shot. And that's where we're at right now. And that has uh, brought up the discussion over um, uh, the fisheries activities and the fishing sector in general. And that has uh, opened a new, uh, a, a broader opportunity and a broader discussion about the role of um, Farming in land and in, in in the sea and and the many activities that you can do that are closer to agriculture and to an agriculture way of doing things, but doing them in the sea. So having um, cultivating uh, fisheries um, and uh, and and cultivating other products that also are um, are, are normally just catched. Uh, just extracted and now would be on that sense. So our transformations, I think, and our relationship between 
agro and conservation has started or, or it's being um, led by this effort at, at the marine level uh, where we're starting to see and to uh, focus research and focus innovation on that, on, on treating our marine landscape as we've treated agriculture and of conducting activities of aquaculture and, and similar activities in, um, in a more agricultural fashion. So, uh, so I just wanted to point that out because that is probably the place where we're seeing most of, of that change. Now going inland and, and looking at the, the change, the way that policy and concepts of change in, in, in the conservation effort, we, we must um, keep in mind that when conservation started in Costa Rica, we had a very different mindset as to what development meant. Uh, development meant um, cutting down the forest and the way in which people became um, acquired property rights, but, but what was by precisely by destroying the forest, by clearing it, something that we call improving the land, las mejoras. And that is the way, that's what's, that is what was happening from the late 40s in Costa Rica up to the, the late 60s, precisely when protected areas um, began to um, be created in areas that were in most cases in dispute with, um, uh, with, with farmers, farmers that were at the edge of what was called the, the agricultural frontier. And the agricultural frontier was precisely the edge where the forest was being um, destroyed in order to bring cattle or to plant maize and, and, maize and, and, and beans. Um, We've come a long way since that, and we're at the point where we're understanding how the productivity of the land um, is based on the services that are mostly provided by those forest areas, forest masses that um, um, are able to generate the uh, water in particular as one of the key um, ecosystem services and pollination. And we just uh, finished a study in Costa Rica looking at our natural capital and um, the top environmental service, the, the, the top rated environmental service, the one that has the highest value in terms of our production is precisely pollinization. So what's interesting about what we see foresee as future in, in this relationship, in this sort of changing relationship between conservation and agriculture that, as I mentioned um, before, started in, in complete opposition. Conservation started saving or, 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 or uh, buffering the areas where agriculture was expanding, but it was a very different agriculture. As I, as I mentioned, it was a more family oriented, um, very uh, small scale, and that has completely shifted into mostly industrial agriculture and um, and elements that that uh, that uh, paint a very different landscape. Though in in our, in our current state, and in, and I have to emphasize that it is a very dynamic relationship. The role of water, the role of pollinization, as I mentioned, um, the role of protecting production areas from. Um, uh, big atmospheric events, big uh, weather events, like um, we just had um, very serious flooding in the Northern and Caribbean basin of, of, of our country. And uh, we're also exposed in the Northern Pacific to dry areas, strong dry areas. And, and the investments that we do in order to protect production are very much in line with our biodiversity goals and our, our climate agenda. So um, the type of active actions for uh, conserving and protecting our, um, our, our, our forest and our biodiversity are directly linked to those efforts to make sure that we're going to be, to continue being an, an uh, effective and productive um, agricultural tropical country in the, in the foreseen 50 or, or 100 years. And, and that is, I think, the, the, the greatest change and the, the view, the, 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 the framing that we're using to guide 
both our agriculture um, policies and our conservation policies. And, and just to just to finish, I want to name our um, our, our NAMAs, our, our, our nationally um, determined um, measures of um, of production. And, and we've uh, developed NAMA programs for our key uh, products. We have cattle under a NAMA program and we have uh, coffee under a NAMA program. And what we have done is orient that um, uh, re re um, reduced emission type of model of production and we've developed it at uh, pilot scales and we're now looking in in cattle and in and in coffee at, to a upscaling effort of how do we take that that we've learned for uh, small pilot farms and take it up to a to, to the broader scale in order that that becomes the mainstream way of production. One that is looking and measuring the amount of um, emissions that a farm has and how do we uh, constantly reduce that amount of, um, uh, of emissions. And, um, and that measuring of emissions becoming part of the way that you do agriculture and the way that you are measuring your effectiveness and, and the value of your product. Because I mean, part of the effort is that we will get a differentiated price for that um, differentiated way of production that, that considers its, its um, carbon emissions. Um, we are now coming into introducing uh, NAMAS for, uh, for sugar cane, NAMAS for rice and for um, bananas in general, bananas and, and plantains, all musasias. And, uh, and that is where the edge is. And what I uh, want to emphasize is that this is both, this is both the effort um, put by the Ministry of Agriculture as well as by the Ministry of Environment in um, keeping this connection linked. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a really amazing. Thank you for taking us to the, to you know the work of Costa Rica, and I feel it's when we look at the national level and consider other development goals, and that we begin to see how crucial agricultural landscapes are. Um, so I appreciate taking us from sea to land, um, and looking at the active actions that we can take and must must take moving forward. Um, so what I'd love to do now, two other speakers to join us, so we can start to really have a conversation um, about this. And these are both um, incredible internationally recognized ecologists. First, we have Jody Hilty, who is a deputy leader of the IUCN Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group and a lead author on the IUCN Global Guidelines for Connectivity. And secondly, we have Madhav Karki, who is an adjunct professor in Nepal uh, and the deputy chair of the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management and also a member of the multidisciplinary expert panel of the IPBES. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you've appreciated getting, you know, to hear that keynote and that started to um, spark some thoughts now on this conversation that we're about to have. Um, and if you don't mind me getting right into it, I, I kind of want to ask one of the questions um, that's quite important. So one of the key contributions for agricultural landscapes is that they can increase habitat connectivity across land and sea areas, um, which is crucial for effective conservation. So um, perhaps, Jody, this is a question best posed to you. Um, can you explain the difference between structural and functional connectivity and what adequate measures we need to achieve functional connectivity? So can you just bring us bring that link together for everyone? But way to dive right into the deep science. Well, um, I love science, so this is great. Yeah, so when we think about connecting, let's say two protected areas where we have populations of an animal that need to move back and forth, um, we have to figure out where these animals are going, right? And so one of the common ways that we might explore that is looking at what we call structural connectivity. So we might use satellite imagery or photographic imagery to look at where the forest or where a similar ecosystem is connecting between say two protected areas. And that would be structural connectivity. We're saying, is the habitat there that they might uh, associate with and might be able to move through? But we don't actually know when we do that kind of analysis, whether it's actually being used. So then there's that other piece called functional connectivity. And that's when we actually know 
that the animal that we're targeting that we think needs to move from A to B is actually doing that movement. And we might be able to detect that or monitor that using things like uh, GPS collars. So actually following the animal or use over a longer time period, we can, for example, snag hair off of animals and begin to detect whether they're sharing genetics or whether they're genetically isolated. So that's the difference between structural and functional. That's really helpful. And um, if you don't mind, I think it's, it's helpful for everyone to kind of think about the unique role that agricultural landscapes can play. And, and if, if anyone had the opportunity to, to read some of the, the background reading attached to this GLF Live, um, that's, you know, 50% of the world's land. And so, you know, admitting that from how we're thinking about biodiversity conservation um, is probably not the right way to go moving forward. Um, so I just want to offer, maybe you might have the opportunity to share any remarks that you have after hearing the keynote um, or the, the topic of this live session before we get into the, you know, the nitty gritty of some of the questions. What do you want the audience to know about this? Did you ask me to react, Salina? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, just your reflections. <laughs> Well, I'm, I think Judy is an uh, <clears throat> expert on that uh, topic. Uh, for me, I think uh, looking at landscape level, structural connectivity is very important. Uh, the interaction between individuals and, in, and environment in changing climate and changing land use, uh, I think is very important. Um, and if the species, uh, for example, um, uh, wildlife species, uh, if they can find similar uh, different structures. Say we have uh, in a mosaic landscape situation, we have uh, forest and then we have agroforest and we have pasture land. Uh, so if, if, if the structure of the ecosystem is suitable for the species to, to get, uh, you know, the, to you know, actually move uh, based on their sort of behavior, uh, then I think we have the structural connectivity. Uh, the functional, I would say, connectivity is basically species at certain species level. And for us, uh, the conservation connectivity experts, I think it's very important that we ensure uh, the structure, uh, the ecosystem structure and ecosystem function or habitat structure and function both are maintained uh, so that we have the connectivity and we have conserved the species. So uh, I think, you know, in Costa Rica, one of the things that's so amazing is that you can look back in time at their protected areas and their structural connectivity, and you can see that they actually made a conscious effort in agricultural landscapes to sort of rebuild that structure, such as around rivers and other places, and recreate structural connectivity in these working landscapes. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible example. That's wonderful for you know those of us who are concerned about the biodiversity crisis and and you know don't see how we might be able to manage that uh, to see that that could be a pathway forward. Um, so if we can take a step back and and just reflect on habitat connectivity at the moment, um, can you share to what degree right now this is being affected by climate change and human behavior, um, which we all imagine quite strongly and heavily, and more importantly, what type of species are most affected? I can jump in first, but mm -hmm. there have been a number of global analyses that have happened that have been looking at how connected are the existing designated protected areas. And depending on the analysis, it's, it's analysis that's been done, it's somewhere between seven and 11% of our existing protected areas are connected. That means that the rest of them are isolated. They are islands in the middle, you know, essentially of nature surrounded by humanity. And this is really a big problem for a lot of different species. It's a problem, particularly because of climate change. We know that as certain environments change with the changing climate, that species, plants and animals need to be able to move and find that climate that is going to be sufficient over the longer term. So we're seeing trees moving north, 
We're seeing animals moving up in elevation, changing their slope aspect, um, et cetera. And so um, in order for them to be able to do this, they have to get through the sea of humanity. And this is where it's really important to think about connectivity outside of protected areas. And that's in these working uh, landscapes. And uh, it goes to, you know, what do we need to have uh, in order for these animals and plants to move. And it depends on, on what species we're talking about. So there are some animals that with or without connectivity or with, with or without climate change, they need to be able to move. And those are animals like wolverines or grizzly bears or other large carnivores, tigers that often get stuck in small protected areas in too small of a population and they're ultimately going to go extinct if they're not connected to other protected areas that have larger populations. But there are also plants that move really, really slowly over time um, that also can get isolated and would, if there wasn't this sort of wall of humanity, be able to naturally be moving. Um, and we have to think about those kinds of uh, species as well. Over to you, Madhav. Yeah, I think Nepal offers a very good example uh, where we have a uh, we have a situation where women, uh, you know, sort of uh, induced changes, uh, especially land use changes, uh, has fragmented the elephant habitat. Uh, as you know, that we have the plains where we have a transboundary landscape, in fact, wherein the, uh, the elephant moved from India to Nepal and then uh, to India and might be even going to Bhutan or Bangladesh. So uh, we have a situation where we have this connectivity is broken. And so WWF and uh, especially WWF has been working that I, uh, that I arc, arc landscape uh, connectivity project uh, and they actually have done this landscape connectivity and it has uh, improved the uh, conservation of elephants. So that's one, uh, one example. And we also have tigers using the same habitat. So it's more challenging. I would say the women uh, caused, I would say, fragmentation of uh, habitat uh, has been, I would say, exacerbated by climate change. And these two uh, drivers has actually uh, this uh, created this, um, I would say, habitat uh, fragmentation and the, the connectivity, uh, I think, uh, can be uh, maintained by actually uh, through uh, human, uh, again, management. So we need a, a human ingenuity here where uh, facing these two type of climate uh, and then the human um, uh, anthropogenic uh, challenges, how how can be maintained connectivity conservation? So uh, this this is a very good example where it, there have been successful cases, and there is also now north south um, landscape concept where we are trying to uh, con uh, you know uh, create the connectivity for the plant species which are also threatened by climate change. So as as you're kind of telling us which these species are. And, you know, you think of the big ones, the wolverines, tigers, um, you know, sharing landscapes can lead to some human and wildlife conflict. So um, I'd love to hear how is this best managed, perhaps in Nepal, and then Jody, from your perspective, uh, where you've seen this happen? Yeah, so uh, we have several situations where, you know, women, wildlife, um, uh, conflicts are created, and uh, this this is because uh, uh, the same uh, I would say the habitats are uh, used by women and wildlife, uh, and we have a situation where it's not only uh, women and animals, but also it could be um, women and then uh, like for example the farmers, agriculture and conservation. Uh, there are two, two groups, uh, they also um, have conflict because often conservation, conservationists or conservation um, colleagues are blaming agriculture for encroaching upon conservation areas, protected areas, and um, threatening biodiversity. So uh, the only solution is, uh, I think the 
and that has been tested. Uh, is uh, there has to be dialogue between different landscape component stakeholders and managers, and these dialogues um, uh, should aim at uh, actually um, uh, convincing or demonstrating to uh, stakeholders uh, the shared value which they gain by uh, cooperating and collaborating uh, in conserving. Uh, you must have read Ayushian's um, publication, uh, which is uh, kind of a common common area or common space uh, where different landscape users uh, can can actually collaborate. So, if I take example uh, of wildlife and women uh, in Nepal, we have uh, created these buffer zones where the the women they get the resources which they used to traditionally get get from the core protected area from the buffer zone area. And at the same time, the animals, uh, when they spill over from the core area, uh, they can find refuge in the buffer zone area. So this way you protect the core, uh, the more uh, rare endangered vulnerable species in the core area. And then you also help people meet their livelihood needs in the buffer zone area. So the challenge is how, how big should be the buffer zone. Uh, and uh, always there is a, space limitation. So I think this is where you need to uh, build in multiple use of uh, this landscape uh, where different um, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, needs of both women and animals can be, can be, uh, can be, uh, can be mobilized. And uh, nature-based tourism or ecotourism is, is one of the successful example wherein you can protect the animals at the same time. You can also meet the livelihood. So this example of buffer zone management, uh, where we have a very participatory system, uh, can reduce uh, the, the conflict and uh, and the, the process is to have constant dialogue between different users. And same, I could say we are talking, talking about the conservation um, and agricultural kind of a, a interfa interface or tension. And um, uh, uh, for example, a lot of um, uh, the conservation uh, uh, colleagues feel that the agriculture doesn't have much conservation value. But I think uh, if we really uh, uh, do the true uh, or assess the true value of uh, agricultural landscape, uh, you will get agrobiodiversity. You will, uh, in fact, um, uh, get um, uh, some of the uh, services, ecosystem services with protected area uh, can give even in, uh, in uh, agriculture, agro, agroforestry landscape, uh, thereby reducing pressure uh, uh, on the protected area and thus improving the conservation uh, efforts in the protected area. So there is a win-win solution but I think dialogue, transdisciplinary approach, and uh, understanding each other's um, uh, efforts, and in, fa in fact, uh, creating synergy are the way to go. I appreciate that reflection, not only on human to wildlife conflict, but the human to human conflict of conservationists and farmers that really gets at the heart of uh, what we're talking about today, the need to look at those shared values and multi multiple uses of the landscape. So. Um, I think that's it's helpful to see the link now, to, even reflecting back on um, the minister's uh, vice minister's remarks in Costa Rica and, and watching that integrated approach from both ministries. Um, Jody, I don't know if you have something else you want to add in, in terms of best managing the conflicts. Yeah, I guess I would just add, you know, I think a lot of times um, there's this perception that agriculture and ranching might be counter to conservation. And actually, in a lot of ways, these entities are all working towards the same vision. One of the things that we see globally is we're seeing the loss of this managed landscape, right? And, and actually humanity really needs it because this is where our food comes from. And so we do need to work to conserve it together. If you look at states like Montana in the United States, that has one of the most, it has the most environmental constitution and it was written by the ranching community who really wanted to see this open space continue. And I think one of the challenges in this region, the Yellowstone to Yukon region, including that mountainous area of Montana is that um, now we're seeing the return of grizzly bears and of wolves. Well, actually by the time 
cattle got to Montana, those animals were wiped out. So there is no memory of practicing good husbandry. There are no sort of traditions of using tools to keep livestock and carnivores uh, out of conflict with one another. And so the real need is for these communities to come together and learn to uh, use new tools that actually are in places like Nepal and around the world so that this can be the one place in the world where we can su sustain these large carnivores. I would say though that I just wanted to comment that sometimes it's not the large carnivores. Sometimes it's the smaller plants and things. Uh, my family comes from Iowa and is an agricultural family. And there was some discussion about creating a wetland, a natural wetland. And I suggested that we bring back milkweed, which is a really critical plant for monarch butterflies. And one of my family members said, well, thank goodness my land isn't next to yours because the last thing I want to deal with is more milkweed. Um, but at the same time, if we were to sit down and have that, you know, a broader conversation, everyone would recognize the importance of pollinators in agriculture and therefore the importance of those riparian corridors, which are often the hosts of those pollinators, the agricultural needs. So it's, a, it's about the much more complex systems and are, we are part of nature and we depend sí, on these natural uh, uh, tools to help us get our farming and ranching done. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I feel like as you were saying that um, there's definitely people in the audience who probably recall those those same conversations or moments of conflict or tension um, when discussing how to how to manage um, land and, and thinking about biodiversity. So um, I want to invite the audience who's here. I'm loving to see where everyone's joining in from Nigeria, Mexico, and that's just on the English. Um, link. Um, if you have any questions, just because we're about to wrap up, it would be wonderful if you sent them in so we have the opportunity to pose it um, or even to share your experiences, uh, anything that's coming to mind. So the next uh, question that I have is around um, the protected areas that you talked about earlier. So it, it, apparently fewer than half, around 43% of the 25,000 or so species assessed to date um, have adequate coverage by protected areas. So if protected areas are not meeting those needs, and it seems like we probably cannot get enough protected areas and able to do so, um, what are the best available options to assure the conservation of vital species populations that we have? Yeah, so I guess I would just start off by saying it's really Yeah, okay, I think um, that's very good question. <laughs> Go ahead. Denise. Go ahead, Mado. <laughs> That is you want to go or go ahead or should I go ahead? You go ahead. Okay, me, because I love uh, this question is uh, very close to my heart. <laughs> uh, because we did assessment um, in uh, the IPES, uh, Asia Pacific Biodiversity uh, Ecosystem Service Assessment, I was the co-chair. And we concluded that uh, the protected area coverage, both in landscape and seascapes, has increased but biodiversity loss is also increasing. So definitely there's something wrong. So this question is that a lot of, um, uh, more than half of the species are outside the protected areas, especially uh, rare endangered and threatened species are outside the protected areas. So how should we protect them? I offer five options and uh, these are tested and demonstrated options. Uh, first, uh, uh, which I use here itself is uh, sampling and we have two, uh, motion say in uh, in world congress is uh, agro ecosystem conservation uh, through agroecological approaches and you all know agroecology plays very important role uh, in maintaining biodiversity and uh, also reducing spillover of uh, genosis uh, right now we have the challenge of pandemic we have climate change challenge we have poverty we have hunger uh, we have biodiversity loss and in fact if we do this, um, what we call the um, agroecological approaches, uh, and um, uh, we can we can um, address some of the challenges. And the way we can address it is that um, agroecological or agroecosystem based conservation uh, agriculture 
Uh, right now, has many names: conservation agriculture, organic agriculture, low input, low external input agriculture, or what have you. Uh, but basically, what it means is that you um, uh, reduce the input, you know, um, uh, inputs. Uh, this green revolution inputs, which many small farmers, millions of small farmers around the world, do not uh, have access, do not have access. To anyway, uh, and um, um, you know, use more uh, inputs uh, from the from the uh, from the nature. And uh, in my country, Nepal, farming system approach or cropping system approach, where agriculture, livestock, uh, forest, and then the pasture land, they have very uh, close interdependence. Uh, so this this uh, system is kind of a nature based nature based solution. Uh, for, I would say, addressing climate change. Uh, it can do both mitigation and adaptation, and it, it has several core benefits. So the first approach is agroecology. Uh, just to go more, uh, I would say, I would say briefly, a second is something, uh, as uh, all of you know, that uh, food, energy, water, nexus, there have been a lot of publications. But what this nexus has forgot about is, is the, is the fuel which energizes this nexus has been uh, not used, and that is biodiversity. Without biodiversity, food, energy, water um, cannot uh, really um, uh, uh, be developed and, uh, and uh, uh, ecosystem services so increased. So food, water, energy, nexus, and uh, on this I have a peer-reviewed paper, which I will uh, link of which I will share. The basic concept is water, energy, biodiversity are essential components of building a sustainable food system. Green revolution technologies uh, actually and package of practices have ignored these ecosystem services. Uh, and we have a situation where a very large number of populations are food and nutrition insecure. So biodiversity, especially agrobiodiversity, uh, which is in decline in many parts of the world, uh, in all parts of the world, in fact, uh, provide this vital uh, cross-cutting element uh, in the in the uh, in the nexus in in improving the the interlinkages among the components such as water energy biodiversity and if we consider biodiversity we invest, invest in biodiversity then in water yield will be increased then energy yield uh, uh, definitely will increase in a mountain situation where we have a lot of hydropower clean energy and thereby then food uh, food security food system can be improved and made more resilient. So uh, that is my second option. And third, you you must be knowing Japan, Japan's uh, Satoyama Initiative, which is Satoyama is a landscape approach, uh, which is a, a socio-ecological production system. I think that is very sustainable. And it can also uh, offer protection for these um, species which are threatened. And um, I will not take a lot of time. Maybe there are questions. Uh, and the fourth is, uh, new generation of integrated or uh, participatory watershed management. Uh, a lot of watershed management activities, which were of uh, old generation nature, focused on drivers of change, which are direct drivers of change within the watershed. Our new uh, approach should really address the drivers of change, which are outside, which are underlying drivers, such as human pressure, such as uh, demand for water, demand for, um, I would say, uh, uh, um, agricultural products. Um, uh, so if we address the issues which are beyond watershed by involving stakeholders and manage watershed in a participatory way, both for conservation and for agricultural production, and also for water, water I think uh, the uh, watershed uh, uh, conservation um, uh, can, can provide both livelihood benefits and also the conservation benefits. And my final option is um, payment for ecosystem services. All of you know uh, that payment for ecosystem is an incentivized mechanism uh, to, uh, to help farmers do uh, uh, or, or may realize the value which they put in, uh, in which they, which they build uh, in agro ecosystem uh, by increasing the um, uh, value of nature or increasing the ecosystem goods and services. But they, are not get, they do not get paid for it. And uh, there are examples in Vietnam, in Nepal, in Indonesia, in uh, which is called uh, in the mountain landscape, rewarding upland poor for their ecosystem services, rupees, 
or payment for equestrian services in Bolivia, it has been very successful. The upland farmers were provided uh, incentive by the lowland water users, and they uh, then uh, pro, you know, practice more ecologically sound agriculture, agroecological um, uh, way. Uh, so this, this way, they, they were rewarded for conserving equestrian services. So, so this is a voluntary system. You can also have market-based system where water users are paying for, like in New York uh, City, uh, they pay for um, uh, to the farmers for not um, you know, extensively using, using their lands. Landscape. So there are several options. These are demonstrated successful uh, examples. If we scale up and scale out, I'm sure they can uh, protect uh, these uh, many species and we can conserve biodiversity. Thank you. Thank Duty you. Sorry. I... <laughs> no, it's lovely to get a comprehensive overview and and to understand those very practical options that are available to us. Um, yeah, Jody, is there anything you want to add to that? Well, or build on I, I, that was wonderful to hear and very comprehensive. And I think um, maybe I can just tell a story of where sometimes it can be a win-win situation. So in the arid west of the y to y region, like in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, you know, one of the challenges is water, right? And so, um, you know, what has happened over time in some places is during, during really hot, dry years like this year, um, it, it's hard to maintain cattle on the landscape and they can actually kind of have negative impacts impacting river and riparian zones that vegetation around rivers and um, at the same time those riparian zones are really important for wildlife but they also slow down the water and make it available for the ranching community as well as uh, communities towns and cities downstream later in the year so by working together to restore those riparian zones. And that can be even things like bringing in beavers because beaver dams slow water flow um, and store that water. They also help to make that water cooler because the water that filters into the ground and then comes back out underneath beaver dams is only about 55 degrees. And so it can help with climate change. And so ultimately, just doing something like restoring a river zone, a river uh, riparian zone can help the ranching community so that they have water later in the year. And then it also helps biodiversity. So I, I think really focusing on those places where there are win-wins can be really helpful. So I just want to um, reflect on what's happening uh, just in the chat. Some, you know, there's some different questions going on, uh, but particularly Miriam, who had talked about uh, a mangrove system in Mexico that is being threatened by expanding human settlements. And I think at the moment she's feeling like, well, what, what are governments actually doing um, and that they're not doing that much? So I, I'm curious, is there any uh, reason for hope at the moment in terms of, you know, what's happening at a global level, uh, where are the opportunities that we can uh, be a little bit more hopeful in, in seeing action happen on the ground? I'll jump in before my dad this time. <laughs> I think uh, we met, uh, Judy, why don't you uh, do that thing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, you know, with mangrove systems, what we're finding and what we're seeing around the world is that uh, many governments are starting to use what they call green infrastructure to help buffer climate change and, ha and in fact, working to restore things like mangroves because they can buffer from the increase in coastal storms and things like that. And so I would encourage this person to really think, uh, look at some of the examples around the world and use those uh, to build a case with that government. Um, I'm always a glass half full kind of person. I think it's amazing when we look at um, the global biodiversity goals that we are one, continuing to strive towards what nature needs. And also if you look back um, if, if you have the opportunity to look back at where we were in the 1900s or even in the 1800s, we've actually, yes, the biodiversity is in crisis, but we have been trying and we have been increasing protected areas. And it's only recently that we've even started to really 
take seriously marine protected areas and they've taken off. And uh, to me, I think that's a symbol that we can continue to work toward the right direction um, so that we can conserve biodiversity and, and in doing so also humanity. Mantav, if you want to add. Oh. So this is a very big question. I was the member of the scientific advisory group uh, that published uh, the UNEP publication, Making Peace with Nature. So uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, addressing uh, biodiversity crisis, but the pandemic, uh, the health crisis is upon us. And of course, the climate crisis, if you saw the report, uh, IPCC report yesterday is is um, uh, is uh, with us. I mean, is really confronting us, uh, and we have hunger. So the global communities uh, right now are offering this build back better greener, and this is where I think uh, Judy, you mentioned the green uh, kind of solutions. Yes, definitely, we need green, resilient, inclusive solutions, because no one should be left behind. And that's, uh, again, SDG. So I think to address this uh, multiple challenges, um, we also have opportunities. Uh, this decade, 2021-30, is a ecosystem restoration or degraded land restoration uh, decade. And uh, research, and then the, uh, I would say, evidence have shown that uh, while we have 25% of the world's land degraded, uh, if we uh, restore uh, this degraded land in an ecosystem uh, framework where we are restoring biodiversity, we are restoring water system, we are also restoring um, Connected, connectivity, the habitat, and we are also also creating uh, flood defenses and uh, mitigating climate or adapting to climate change. Uh, that is what is you know building back better and greener. Uh, so I would say that we should offer uh, what we called more um, ecosystem based. Uh, restoration of degraded land or rehabilitation of degraded land, uh, which provides uh, green jobs, which provides um, really access to food, uh, access to uh, nutri nutrition security to poor, but at the same time also protect biodiversity. And this is possible. In fact, a $1 investment in degraded land rehabilitation gives a way off of almost $36. So there are many examples, and we have this 25% of the world's one-fourth of the land degraded, both in natural habitats and natural system and modified systems. So let's promote, I would say, landscape level, uh, ecosystem-based restoration and nature-based solution to address climate change by promoting afforestation and reforestation, by building a water system, and by also providing jobs and uh, uh, land uh, for the poor. Uh, this is what I consider uh, would be, uh, you know, really uh, meeting uh, the, the global community's concern uh, about uh, loss of biodiversity because biodiversity cannot be, you know, the biodiversity loss cannot be halted if we do not address the need of the poor uh, or the need of the people. And right now, I think the pandemic has uh, impacted uh, globally. So we have to also address those people which have been uh, affected by the by the pandemic. So, so this, I think we need a holistic and we need a global, uh, but I think it's a, it's a, a local action uh, and global thinking. I think thinking local, acting global, uh, acting <laughs> local thinking global is would be a solution uh, and in building back better and uh, greener and building resilient green economies. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madhav, because I think, you know, inadvertently you you've managed to ask a question uh, that Odes had posed from Ghana um, on how we bridge the gap between conserving biodiversity and agriculture since the population is growing and there's this need to farm and produce food. Um, and I think your, your emphasis at the end around the local action and the global thinking um, to really shift the way we view these these two, um, you know, issues. And then the fact that we think of them as two separate topics, the agriculture arena where we talk about productivity and, and then biodiversity where we, you know, predominantly talk about protection. So I think um, this conversation has been really great and in, in for all of us who've been watching to re-evaluate how we think about these topics um, and to, yeah, first change our mindset and then be able to, you know, bring that into all the work that we do. Um, so we have another question and probably the last question so we're, since we're getting close on time. Um, and I'm not sure if you both are the best people to answer, but this comes from Adetula, I think in also in Ghana. Um, and he's asking if a landscape with similar species of trees, uh, like a plantation, can be as rich of a landscape with diverse tree species um, in terms of species richness or of their flora and faunal components. So I guess asking a basic question are around biodiversity and whether um, it is as rich when you have, like, say, a plantation. Well, what are some of the trade-offs here and, and wh where do we kind of draw the line between agricultural or managed landscapes being able to enhance biodiversity? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I would say, you know, all landscapes in, in different contexts are going to have different biodiversity values. So the question of if there's a plantation type of a forest, does it have the same value as say a natural rainforest? Well, no, but can it contribute? Absolutely. Um, you know, so when we look at, for example, the research on uh, shade grown coffee versus uh, uh, coffee that has no overstory, right? The research shows that just having some of those trees, which are not the same as say a rainforest, can contribute to increasing biodiversity in a coffee plantation. And so some of it is how is that plantation managed and what's allowed to pass through that plantation. But most certainly a plantation is going to be a better buffer than a mega city right next to a protected area. Um, and so, you know, I think that there are ways that those agriculturalists can, can consider how they're managing that landscape um, to both increase productivity, but also to maintain and or even restore some of the biodiversity that is compatible with that agriculture. So let me make a couple of points here. First of all, I think uh, we have to realize once uh, we lose biodiversity or we destroy a habitat, it is almost impossible to get to the, again, the climax stage or the uh, stage, natural stage. Uh, so there have been a lot of, um, I would say, um, discussion on whether monoculture plantation or agriculture plantation like rubber plantation, coffee plantation, actually adds biodiversity value or habitat value. Definitely they will not offer the same same value which they used to offer as natural uh, habitat. Uh, but uh, studies in China has shown that even in a monoculture situation, uh, after uh, I don't remember how many years, but I think 15 years, 30% uh, of the birds came back and uh, uh, around, I think, uh, a similar percentage of the undergrowth came back. So they do add value. So I say that plantation, first point is that monoculture uh, are not uh, able to, again, uh, produce the same value as the climax uh, habitat, uh, but they do, they do contribute uh, to the habitat conservation. The second point is, in a mosaic landscape, whether once the primary habitat was converted into agriculture, and we have many situations where conversion of the natural system into modified system have been happening. Uh, for example, the urban uh, uh, ecosystem is a modified ecosystem. Uh, uh, I would say that if it depends on the human influence or the human management intensity uh, and the quality, 
uh, we, we can, for example, I talked in Nepal about the buffer zones. Uh, we have this, um, the world famous uh, Royal Chetuvan National Park, which, is, has a, which has a habitat of rhinos, elephants, and uh, tigers. Uh, the buffer zones are actually now the area where we have rhinos and uh, um, uh, rhinos actually uh, habitating. So that means that at least they are getting uh, the value. So that means that uh, in agroforestry situation, and this is agroforestry situation, uh, where uh, we also have um, uh, domestic animals um, also sometimes grazing, uh, so we, we are able to add, to, again, the habitat value. Uh, so in a mosaic landscape, I would say that agriculture uh, activities, if they are done in agroecological situation, then the soil quality will improve, the water will yield will improve, and that will definitely uh, add uh, value or, uh, you know, add synergy uh, to help the other habitat, the forest or the pasture, um, where the wildlife has animals might be habitating, and uh, thereby they will get benefit from the agroecological uh, component of the landscape. So we need to see how we can add synergy and reduce trade-offs between these different components. And that is how I think this uh, mixed landscape or the landscape uh, structure has to be planned and we, have a, we can have landscape connectivity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, especially for spotlighting that uh, first pathway you'd mentioned on agro agroecological principles um, as being really important. Um, I would also be remiss not to not correct myself. The very brilliant Adetula is from Nigeria and not Ghana. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, and I think irrespective of where you are from or are joining today, we very much appreciate you all being a part of the conversation. Uh, it's been a definitely a very lively and, and important one. So I wanna take the time to uh, just wrap up now. And um, I think the, questions that have come up from this discussion and in the chat are super important. Um, there's been one around finance. Where is this finance going? Is it being managed effectively? Um, something that I'm sure we'll, we can take up in future sessions. Um, and another one on pathways for impact. So, you know, what are we using the right, are we engaging the right stakeholders? How do we actually drive the local action and the change on ground? And I think um, this one will certainly be addressed more in the second session of the series, which is happening in just two days on August 12th, which is on the role of agricultural stakeholders as partners in conservation. So I very much appreciate everyone for joining this series. We've taken the first step forward in shifting our thinking. And I think in this next one, we'll move towards translating it to action and seeing how this practically works. Um, so thank you so much, both of you for joining and for engaging in this conversation. Um, I will wrap it up here and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, nice meeting you, Judy. Uh, I think we belong to the same community and hopefully see you in 